Uh, hello and welcome to uh, programming for performance. This is Jörg Steck and I'm Jasmin Katunis and together for the next 90 minutes we will be talking about how best practices when writing code for performance and also maintaining it. Okay, so we have agreed on, because we have more content than we have time, so to uh, skip all the small talk, yeah, and immediately dig into the content. Um, those of you who are frequently attending uh, NAB Tech Days, um, maybe following my sessions before, um, talked a lot about performance, and just to give you a little geography, yeah, when I was talking about performance before, we had these three major areas of performance, that was one thing was, was platform and stuff like this, the other thing was blocking and stuff like this, and the major, or, or the most important area where we have lots of problems and also lots of resolutions, this is this vast area of, of um, query strategies, so where it's about communication between an NAV and SQL server, and our session today is also within this context of query strategy. So, one thing that we have to keep in mind um, for the next uh, yeah, couple of minutes is the, the core architecture of NAV. Um, since the dawn of NAV, so since the very beginning, we always had a three-component architecture. So I'm not talking about a three-tier architecture. We always had these three components, and that means on the left-hand side, we have the seaside world. This is the, the world where you live and breathe every day. This is where you create all the magic, all functionality, interfaces, repo, whatever. So this is, let's say, where you live today. Um, on the other hand, on the right-hand side, we have the database engine, we have the SQL server. Um, and in between, we have, let's say, a kind of moderator, a kind of translator that translates from the seaside world to the SQL world. So, and this is something you need to be aware of. For example, when you, when you create a, a seaside table, you do not create a SQL table. You just create it in C site, and this black box right in the middle is picking up this template and creates the SQL magic. The same goes when you program something, you, you want to query data, you use a find command, but what actually hits the SQL server is a select command. You're not programming a select. So that means it's all done by this black box. This core architecture has advantages, but also has disadvantages. Because that means what you want to have on the left-hand side is not necessarily what you get on the right-hand side on the database level. So, in this session, uh, we have actually two parts. The first part is Yasminka will dig into this um, left-hand side, the, the seaside world, yeah, what you can do about here. And later on, I will yeah, take you over to the dark side when we have to discuss things, how, how they hit SQL Server. Um, yeah, so then, hand it over to you again. Have fun. <laughs> okay, right, so um, when people think about performance, it's usually something they relate to, to hardware, to configuration, to potentially to SQL Server, and um, if they hit a performance issue, then the solution they're looking for usually is ITD doing a bit of magic or someone like you're coming in and just solving all problems. But um, the code you write affects actually the performance just as much as uh, your scaling and your hardware and your configuration. So uh, my part of the presentation will be uh, just about that, trying to, to show how the code you write can affect your performance and what to do about it. So I'll start off uh, with a bit of uh, theoretical background, talk about algorithm efficiency in general, because that, as a theory, applies to both CIL and SQL and whatever you write your code in. Uh, then we'll move on to, to data retrieval methods. Um, that's uh, our statements we use to retrieve data from SQL. 
Um, then some do's and don'ts, some code constructions that we are used to and that have been um, having different effects on performance throughout the versions, throughout the years. Uh, things to keep in mind when writing your code when that are related to performance and affect performance and um, tools that you might uh, use that to help you uh, check and validate your code for performance. Okay, so those of you um, with technical background might remember this, the order of, or the big O. This is a mathematical uh, description. It describes the behavior, the limiting behavior of a function as its data input grows. In computer science, this is used uh, to tell you how complex your algorithm is or how scalable it is. In, in other words, simply put, it tells you how much work your system will have to do to process the data set given your code. So it measures how effective or ineffective your code is. So for example, to illustrate, uh, consider a table with 1,000 records. If an algorithm has a constant order um, of, for example, one, means it will always only execute one operation to process uh, independent of your uh, data set. If it has a logarithmic order, means for a table that has uh, 1,000 rows, it will execute seven operations, and so on. If it has exponential order in this example square, for a table of 1,000 record records, it might end up with million operations. Um, to put that into, into a perspective, in, in, into our more familiar uh, examples, consider um, you want to, you have a value entry table, for example, and you want to filter on item number. So basically all you're doing is a set range and a find statement to get your filtered set. Now when you write that code and execute that code. There is a bit, as, as Jörg uh, has said, uh, going on both on NST and uh, on SQL side. So there is a translation, there is a, the, the whole cache dimension on server side round trips, the server processing, query uh, plans and so on. But we will, um, these are in most cases fixed transaction costs and they are fixed regardless of data size. So we'll look away from them and focus on what is a variable cost, what impacts our performance. So um, if you consider that fine statement, we, we filter again value entry uh, on item number, and we, our value entry table has a thousand records, so we're speaking about Chrome's database. So um, that gets translated bottom line to, to SQL uh, select where statement. Now, if you have an index, for that item number field, for example. If you have an index and SQL actually compiles a query plan, that's index seek. Since uh, uh, an index on SQL is a binary tree, that index seek is a logarithmic order operation. So 1,000 rows, seven of some cycles on SQL side to retrieve your set. If you don't have a good index and SQL ends up with index scan plans or reading all the rows in the table, that means, um, or, uh, logarithm, uh, that means order of linear proportion to data set means 1,000 rows, 1,000 reads, and so on. If you're a bit unlucky with nested uh, inner joints and so on, you might end up with exponential number of operations. Now, a million in this example. Now, a million might sound like a big number for SQL, that's nothing, that's a millisecond, a blink of an eye, so it's not a problem at all. But now consider when your table grows a bit more to what is probably a more realistic value, and that is one million records. The logarithmic, the index seek that we do, has only now, now only costs 14 operations, so has only grown a little. While as index scan now takes million operations, whereas algorithms will take up to billion and more, depends on your algorithm complexity. So, why am I showing all this? So, I want you to, to have a clear picture just how much stress or work a bad 
algorithm or complex algorithm, not bad but, uh, as such, but complex algorithm might cause to the system. So to um, zoom out a bit more and put it into a bit bigger picture, here I have different algorithms and their um, order. I want to, with this, I want to show you how to, to remember just how uh, much an algorithm, complex algorithm, can affect your um, performance. So the x lines, that's the input data in your data set. The y uh, axis, that's number of operations your code is going to cause on the system. So, um, and this is how different algorithms uh, compare when it comes to effectivity. So the best practice is to be within the green belt. That's where you want to be. These are the algori efficient algorithms of low processing orders. Um, now, when, when you measure this complexity, algorithm complexity, um, you have to kind of, uh, co when you compare algorithms, you have to compare apples with apples. Uh, so you cannot compare al algorithm complexity on SQL with uh, CIL. Those are two different categories. And we have things going on on CIL side and then on, on server side and then on SQL side. But, uh, and some fixed transaction cost. But uh, for, for the simplicity, for, uh, let's combine this complexities into one common complexity. So whatever complexity is going to happen on SQL side and whatever happens on server side, uh, combine it in, into a joint complexity and have kind of idea how the code will perform. So you have the whole range of the green belt with well-performing code and low number of operations means also um, a short execution time. And then you have the the red belt, the horrible zone, with a um, very high number of operations means long execution time. So, combined with SQL and CIL operations. The, again, the green belt, that's uh, our data retrieval uh, that is used in a in, um, uh, confined way and where we have a well-indexed database. I call this the Kronos zone because, and Kronos would be your uh, bottom left corner, because basically whatever you write in Kronos will run perfectly well. And this is why, because it's this tiny little bit in the corner in the left, you can't, you can't make it run uh, poorly. But as your data grows, that might look completely differently. So aim is to stay in the green belt to have performant code that is also well indexed. The yellow zone there, that's um, maintenance zone. That's basically where you can um, fix a lot of problems just by handling indexes with the uh, proper indexes and with some simple code adjustment maybe. And the uh, red zone finally on the top, that's uh, overnight processing zone. So this is kind of processes where we tell the customer this needs to be scheduled for overnight and then you know you have to run it once a month or you'll never get it uh, done. So these are the algorithms that basically cause a um, horrible amount of strain on a system. And sure, you can always compensate for that to a certain extent uh, on a hardware side. So you can always overscale to compensate for whatever you throw at that system. Um, there is always a hardware that, that, that will cover it to some extent, but it's an uphill work and it's unnecessary. So that's why this remainder of my part of the presentation is talking about how to avoid it. Unnecessary uh, stress on the system caused by the code. Oops. Okay, so I, I want you to keep this graph in mind just, just to, to, to keep in mind how, how number of operation changes in the green belt and in the red belt. And to put all this into um, our CIL perspective, what does it mean? On SQL, we were looking at the example of reads. What, what, does, what do we measure on CIL? What will this mean on CIL? Well, this whole thing boils to one most important measurement when writing code. So um, the whole algorithm complexity boils down to this. 
to serve around trips. That is what is causing the biggest stress. So basically, uh, lower your algorithm complexity order when writing your code. This means minimize server round trips. The fewer the round trips, the better the performance. So how do we do that? This now is the familiar stuff um, that you've always probably known. First of all, uh, indented loops, where we go through um, loops and within loops, within loops of records to retrieve a few, few records doing something, sometimes to modify or in worst case to, to just read a few records within that selection. That is causing a enormous amount of round trips. Those are the, the algorithms of exponential order usually. So you automatically, by writing that, automatically moving from bumping up from the green zone up all the way up to the red zone. So wherever you can replace the, the very complex uh, indented loops with naturally queries. Queries execute one round trip. So you save, that's the constant green belt. So you, you save your system a lot of work and a lot of stress by replacing the round trips, successive round trips, with one effective query. Now, queries don't cache, uh, too. So, so if you're going to do the replacement, do it somewhere where you know the code won't be repeated within one process excessively, because you want to also benefit from that cache. So um, replace it from the topmost level, to, to uh, put it that way. So queries, use queries uh, um, as, as much as you can. Um, then there are these statements that will that are um, introduced to, to replace your server round trips with one. So set out the calc fields. Um, normally, in uh, yesteryears, we used to, uh, to write calc fields within the loop. Uh, that causes, of course, extra uh, server round trip for every uh, record within that loop, for each record in selection. If you put set out the calc fields uh, outside the loop, you, you replace the whole thing with one uh, round trip. So, so you move from what would have been a linear um, order of complexity, that's the yellow belt, down there to the green belt, just by using um, set out the calc fields. The same applied to calc zooms. There are still many examples where people loop, um, uh, where code loops. Just to uh, summarize a value, use calc zooms where you can. So you go down from the yellow to the green belt from linear complexity to one single round trip. Uh, same goes to modify all and delete all that, that is already uh, widely used. Um, and when you do write code, write with iterations in mind. So, for example, if you do put some loop into a fact box and that fact box ends up on a list, that's going to be kind of refreshed and read for each record on the list that will have um, some implications because you have a fact box that goes for every record and then within that you have your loop on your facts. Well, this is just an example, but then you're automatically and necessarily adding a layer of, of complexity moving into exponential horrible zone. So um, whenever you can, when you write the code, just Plan with, with those iterations in mind. There are tools you can use to, to, to kind of check if you're, if you're there or, or if you have uh, overstepped that. Data retrieval methods. Um, these have not been changed for the last three or four years, I think. They still cause a lot of discussion in the channel for some reason. Um, there is still lots of confusion. It's really quite simple. They are uh, well documented. That documentation stands. So what is written is true. This is what they do and how they should be used. So here we go one by one. Find. Find issues to statements now. In back in yonder days, we had loops with 
some self-tuning number of top select top um, records. So, so if you have 1,000 records, you might have ended with 200 loops or something. Um, find uses two statements now. So it always uses two. If your table is 1,000 or 100,000 records, it will still use two statements. So it has a constant complexity order. It's in the green belt. It find uh, does only two rounds. The first one will sa say um, select top a value that is self-tuning based on some kind of uh, statistics. The second one will retrieve all the rest of the records. When do we use find? We use find when we want to retrieve uh, some selection of records. And we are not absolutely certain that we will read them all. If there is somewhere in that code the chance that we'll pop out of that loop and won't be reading the rest of the records, do not use find. Find is... Uh, 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 sorry, d do use find. Uh, find is uh, for when you don't know how many records you will be reading of the selection you're asking for. So I in if any doubt, use find. Do not default on find set. And now why? So find set does one loop. Find does two. Find set will always do one loop. So you might be tempted to think, well, it's one millisecond faster. It does one instead of two. So it's the default option, no. Um, find set also does exactly that, retrieve you all the records in one loop and place them as network uh, packets. They're waiting there. And then what you might observe, if you are not going to consume all those records, they will be there waiting. So then you will be um, observing a higher number of async network IO weights on SQL side. If you have a SQL, do that look into it. Put simply, you will observe SQL memory pressure. So uh, find set just as that retrieves all these records. If you're not going to consume them, you're pressuring SQL for no reason at all. So find set, when you know you're going to read them, then they're going to um, disappear from the weights. Uh, also, if you are modifying a set, use find set. Whenever you're modifying a record, use find set. Let me repeat that. When you modify a record, use find set, and then use it with the correct parameter. So find set for, is for modifying records. Find first, find last, top first record and uh, bottom record. And is empty that... Um, has been a bit flaky over the versions. It's really simple. If there is any selection within records, you, if you want to know if there is any selection, use is empty. There's no reason to use um, anything else. But is empty has been flaking over the years. All sorts of things have been happening if you use is empty reference um, variable uh, reference the record after that, and. Uh, that is empty is uh, returning only a Boolean uh, variable. So the ref record you reference later basically needs to load up into memory, uh, leading to all sorts of um, we had performance issues, uh, memory leaks, all that has been fixed. So, uh, but but it seems to have been a bit bit unstable um, previously. If you're unsure, um, find first uh, will do the job as well. Whatever you do, you have to keep in mind. Unless you are working with scenario where it's of crucial importance to get a reply to some statement you sent within tenth of a millisecond, it won't matter much what you use of these. Find this quick, so is find set, so is find first, so is find last. They are all one round trip, except find that's two. They're all the green belt, they're all the constant complexity. They do not grow with input data. Your problem, whatever it is, will likely not be here. So uh, it's the complexity of the code we write. It's those indented loops, the excessive round trips that cause the issue. It's hardly ever one of these. Now, there, there are always exceptions. Of course, there are scenarios, but, but really, Whatever you use of these, you'll be fine. So, so um, they get so much attention, I don't, just don't think it's a deserved attention. They don't. They are all just fine, really. 
do's and don'ts. Okay, two things of, um, two ways of uh, doing one and the same thing. Um, left hand side, I do or I don't. Come on. Do. Right. And right hand side, I do or I don't. Well, it is uh, a do, this is how you should do insert, and this is a maybe. So why is it a maybe? Um, now we're speaking about performance. What does the right hand side do? Again, we're speaking about performance. Yeah, so, so I'm, not, I'm not referring to the um, case where obviously it checks if the insert, it'll be a, a control level, but, um, or abort, you'll abort the call in control way, but, but I'm speaking uh, purely of performance. Okay. What does the left hand side do? You're inserting 1,000 records. What will it do? Bulk inserts. So what does the right hand side do? Bell breaks the bulk insert. That's correct. And why May in, I in interrupt. It's called buffered inserts. Yeah, buffered. Not bulk buffered. inserts. Yeah? Buffered. It's important. That's that's true. <laughs> yeah, those are not sequel um, bulk <laughs> inserts, no. Um, quite. So by default Navision will collect all these inserts and punch them into the sequel when, when the loop is basically complete. Those are bu buffered inserts. However, that, that inserting um, algorithm has, a, has some kind of self-tuning algorithm again. So at some point, if your table is sufficiently wide, so if you're inserting sufficiently wide records, that self-tuning algorithm becomes to kind of flatten out. Uh, so the benefit of performance with uh, with buffered inserts starts to level out. So the wider the table, the wider the rows you're inserting, the less the benefit you get from the buffered insert. At some point it, it starts going uh, dropping again. In some scenarios, there are not too many of those, but they keep popping up. In some scenarios, if you are uh, inserting um, very many records in, a, in such a wide table, it might pay off to turn off the bulk, the buffered insert, and you turn it off by doing the if then. So these are these are not your everyday scenarios, but if you come across them, if you do have a very wide table, then you might be better off. You can easily test it and verify it. Maybe better off at some point uh, with without buffered inserts. Uh huh. Left hand side, do or don't? Right hand side? No. Right, simple one. So, so why is that or don't? Sorry? Don't I do that in the other one too? Ah, but you're using Pyro. So what does this mean? This one will will um, generate a round trip for, for the modification and update statement as you need to have it. This one will double it at worst, make it exponential. So this is this has not always been like this. This this is introduced as of. Uh, 2013, I think, before 2013, they did more or less the same job performance-wise, the same number of round trips. Uh, as of 2013, that too, uh, the, the left-hand side is actually uh, causing a far higher number of round trips. So, so um, definite don't. Here. Ah, that's the favorite. So this one is a killer. That, that's, um, uh, what does this do? 
translated to SQL language, this is simply a select distinct. We select one record from a specific selection um, and then repeat that for the uppermost level. It's a select distinct and once upon a time when, when, when these codes were written, it was on a different engine uh, where they were working just fine. On SQL, uh, this, this causes, uh, this is the red zone type of algorithm. This uh, causes the, the exponential, easily causes the exponential number of round trips. Each of those round trips uh, has its penalty. If it's not network latency, then it's the operations on SQL and reads and disk latency and so on. So um, this is kind of a red zone algorithm, select distinct, and we still have them around in code quite, quite a lot. Uh, and it's easily solvable with a simple query and how to translate one to the other. There is a nice design pattern or blog post on design pattern where just that was done with on an um, example from a standard application code. So you can look it up on uh, design patterns, select this thing. So this is a killer. Uh, good example of, of um, how you unnecessarily stress. Uh, so instead of exponential number of round trips, and we are talking on a bigger table it's about millions and billions, you will end up with one. So the difference is really huge. Um, it's not a demo, it says a demo, but it's not a demo. This is what I wanted to, to show. And now if I uh, go here, was it? Does that show now? No. You can just exit, maybe. Uh, yeah, right. I'm still in presentation mode. Right, so this is an example of a code. It's not made up. It's a real thing out there. Um, just to, to show you uh, what, what this looks like. Uh, this is kind of a select of this thing, just with really many levels. Um, again, it's not made up, but I took it out of, uh, out of standard application um, and didn't put it in the slide because basically it couldn't fit. Uh, to show you how this this bit looks like, and now I, I I didn't want to run demo because it would take quite some time that we don't have to collect all the details and process them and analyze them and so on. But um, let's see to take it one by one. Uh, so this is. The code, this is just the beginning, beginning of it that you're seeing here. It's a standard application code. Um, what we're looking for, or the result of this, random uh, Kronos, uh, will be some 60 records, the result of this selection. So there are 60 records that fit this uh, description that, that are within the innermost loop. For these 60 records, we will um, hit the innermost loop 74 times. So um, the innermost loop is uh, records that are processed 74 times. This will generate over 800 round trips. So there are 800 uh, round trips with SQL statements resulting out of this. That, in turn, will generate over 37 thousand logical reads on SQL. This table has 300 records on Kronos. So this is back to the graph. This is code. This is uh, what we still do today. This is back to the graph. This is your exponential explosion of activity on SQL depending on the code you write. So whatever code you write does affect performance greatly. So I thought this was a nice example to have. Well, now that, that we've kind of covered in, in very general um, terms the, the best practices, why isn't this reacting? It is. 
other things to keep in mind. Um, subscribers. So, uh, events, fantastic feature. We, we use it, we love it, we need it, and we're going to keep on using them. Um, why are they here at all? Well, subscribing to event adds another dimension of complexity to your algorithm. So, when you have to use them, we have to use them, so, so uh, I'm not saying don't use them, but careful how you use them. Um, when you subscribe, subscribe to the most granular level you can. So if, if you want to, um, say you want to modify value of one field, whenever a user modifies value of address field, or <laughs> anything, doesn't matter. Um, it might pay off to actually rather subscribe to the same uh, kind of field on three different pages and do it there than to think of, well, why don't I just subscribe on a table? And then you can't uh, always solve it through the page. You have to subscribe to, uh, in many scenarios on the table. So when you subscribe on the table, try to again be as granular as possible, go to the field if you can, and avoid on modify or triggers of the table. Why? Because they will add another um, uh, dimension of complexity to any algorithm you write. Modify all, you've just turned them off. You subscribe on modify to on modify trigger off your table. You don't need to write a code in that subscriber. It's there. It's active, empty. Modify all, no more. So your code that is modify all that's supposed to, to process modify at one go 2,000 records will now generate 2,000 round trips just because there is an active subscriber to, to the table. Um, and whatever you do, try to stay away from the subscribing to system events like on database modify, for example. You can imagine what that will do uh, to any code you write. So um, it might be look like a good place to, to, to start if you want to do, I don't know, change log. Well, on the database log modify, have few things to hook into, it's easy. It affects, greatly affects, it will affect any record you modify in the entire database. So, so you subscribers, you have to just think about it when, when designing. Each of them will add a complexity on, on tables, on algorithms you write. Um, Mark, it's, um, it's a, a good feature to use uh, on your user interface if your user wants to yeah, mark a few records here and there, it's perfect to use. When you use it in code, if you start placing uh, marks uh, and not sequentially, it, they will start generating uh, SQL round trips per, per mark. So that might easily um, lead to, to excessive number of round trips. I don't know how much mark is used in the code, but just to mention them. Great. Uh, they are not quite in the same category as all the other stuff I've been talking about. They have nothing to do with round trips. They're uh, purely their effect is on SQL. They, they are um, popular, frequently used, and they come with a steep price, uh, performance-wise. They have their benefits too. Well, they have um, wider um, selection or more numbers to select of than if you use integer, integer key. They have low... Um, occurrence of hot contention spots. So, so they have their benefits. Uh, however, they are also expensive at inserts, they are expensive at seeks, they are expensive at sorts. Uh, they do use uh, the fragmentation. So um, it, it seems to be a popular feature, but it has, again, nothing with algorithm complexity to do, but it has everything with that locking to do. This is what you'll typically see if you're um, using intensive uh, uh, transactions that involve grids as primary case, uh, mind you, not, not in general. And now, the things we've been talking about so far are uh, the things that, that uh, create a lot of work at, at SQL Server. 
making everything run slow. Like I said, an overnight process that we usually end up, this is just slow, this always just runs slow. They don't leave footprint. That's the problem with, with uh, uh, code that's not performant. There is no footprint. You can open uh, all SQL monitors, everything looks fine. CPU low, memory low, nothing to complain about, but it just takes forever. Those are excessive round trips, but you have the different kind of, of uh, performance issue, and that's things that do leave uh, quite quite significant uh, footprint, and that's normally, we measure that normally in CPU and memory, so those would be traditionally reports and usage of .NET variables. They will leave some uh, footprint. Now, designing uh, reports and report performance is a topic on its own, so we won't uh, go into too many details here. Uh, but the, the same known principles uh, matter here, data set size. When you design reports, you have to remember that it will all be um, uh, sent to the client. Yes, you have 64-bit client, but uh, again, think of the round trips. Uh, that, that's what they will cause and not to SQL and to, to the client, and memory consumption. Then there, there, um, there is a memory consumption issue that's no longer issue on a Win client, but then who use Win client? We all use web client now. So um, there is a nice article about memory consumption on web client, what you can possibly do to some extent to it. Um, then then uh, the CAS policy switch, uh, that is um, where you have to decide between memory leak and performance. So basically, uh, you might end up with a memory leak if you opt for performance and vice versa. Uh, but that's how you can adjust it. Uh, there is, a, you can read more details uh, about it on the net. The, this, this switch, uh, this uh, policy is a uh, um, NST configuration parameter that you can turn on and off to, to opt for then. Um, memory consumption, uh, good memory consumption, or uh, better performance. And .NET variables, they will, um, well, people often uh, think, it's when they are not cleared up that they can use a lot of memory unexpectedly, and people always accept, uh, expect garbage collector to do that job, and it will. It will clean up eventually, but it doesn't always kick in when we think it does so. Um, .NET might uh, and reports might use um, quite a lot of memory, leaving quite a significant footprint. And finally, um, tools. So, how can you verify that your code is performant? That you you write everything you write in Chronos. That will it will remain that way, even as your database grows. Um, well, one thing you can do, uh, th there is no tool that I know of, at least, that kind of covers it all. But uh, I tend to use combination. In combination, they'll give me the answer. Uh, code coverage uh, feature in NAV. If you start code coverage uh, feature, search in the window, write code coverage, start, run, stop. Uh, it'll show you the code that was executed uh, during the capturing. One of the columns is called number of hits. It shows how many times each code line was actually um, executed. So that gives you some, uh, the first proportion. It tells you, um, you know how many uh, data your Kronos table has. So it kind of gives you proportion. Are you uh, running this too much? Is this being executed um, spaghetti code called from various places and end up being running over and over again? So number of hits will give you an indication of um, if your code is being executed too much. That's one tool. And then um, it won't tell you anything about the server round trips it might cause when you're vo modifying, for example, within the loop and then uh, um, uh, changing the, the range of the fields and then the reiterating and so on. So um, those things that cause extra round trips, you won't capture them with any tool that I've heard of. So, but what I normally do is um, start profiler as we in, in the end all end up doing and basically just um, 
observe profiler. When you do have excessive round trips, so you can do, you can collect everything to a, a SQL profiler table and just simply observe how many of that statement has been sent. Because when you do have excessive round trips, so, so really slow processes, as I said, none of the alarms will go off. Memory will be low, CPU will be low, reads will be low. Um, uh, if you uh, look at the profile on SQL Server, it just looks perfect. The problem is that the same statement will be going over and over and over and over again. So that kind of gives you indication, OK, I have a piece of code that, that um, can be optimized. It's generating too many round trips. So you can always, um, the, the slide I was showing earlier with the um, number of SQL statements, that, that's basically how I do it. I, I, I capture with code coverage to see number of hits it generates in the code and then um, capture the profiler and see how many um, round trips the same cause, uh, code has caused. Um, you can profile um, service tier activity, not just code coverage. Uh, you can, code coverage uh, has user interface in nav application. You can do it without user interface. You can do it silently with kind of circular log, uh, so you don't consume all your memory on service tiers. You can monitor um, if you suspect activity um, as, as we don't send user ID to the SQL server, activity that needs to be um, found that generates extra load on the server. You can monitor everything with data collector sets on service tier. We have two kinds, events and, and um, performance. So event uh, collector set will basically give you the same thing as code coverage. And um, resource monitor for things that do leave application footprint uh, for those kind of issues. I'm on overtime, uh, am I? Uh, okay, right, so. We have all the time we need because we are the last one between them and the beer, so <laughs> no problem. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So now you have followed the Jedi's path. Now let's go to the Death Star. Yeah. Um, again, bearing in mind this architecture, left hand side, the seaside world, um, where basically it boils down to avoiding round trips. Sooner or later, the shit will hit the fan anyway. And the place where the shit hits the fan is the SQL Server. So performance problems actually do not happen in your seaside world. Performance problems happen on the database. Now, always assuming now we are done with this round trip thingy. So now, assuming your code works like a charm, still you will see it screws up. And I want to show you the reasons why. In SQL Server, the performance actually is all about data retrieval. So it all depends on how quick data could be retrieved. And I want to give you a very, very simple example here. And uh, my sincere apologies to all those who have previously attended some workshops. You cannot hear that story anymore. Sorry about that. Yeah. Imagine a table like a huge warehouse like this one here. And in this warehouse, you will find thousands of crates of boxes. Yeah, that's in SQL, that would be our pages to store data. And now in these boxes, there are millions of records. Yeah, that'd be color pencils. Yeah, color pencils in different lengths and strengths, and of course, different colors. So this is my table. One of these crates contains the lost arc, if you remember, yeah? Okay, anyway, so now you are SQL Server and I send you in, get me all the red pencils. Yeah, select from pencil where color equal red. So what would you do? Hmm, nothing. <laughs> so yeah, uh, rolling with the eyes, yeah. Um, how in hell should you know where the freaking red pencils are? You can't know that. You don't know that. So what you naturally have to do is you have to open every bloody box here to look up if there's any red pencil. And you would agree with me, this will take forever. And it will take the longer, the more boxes you have to open. Bad performance. So what you need actually is some, some guy around in this warehouse that has some kind of catalog uh, where it says in which box are which kind of pencils. So we call this an in, uh, in SQL Server an index. Yeah? Index originating for the Latin word for to point at something. Yeah? That's why we call it the index finger. Well, so, 
Oh, it's recorded, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so how is an index created? Well, we sent this guy through this warehouse once, opening all the boxes and just writing a list. Okay, black, box, uh, black pencils, box number one, the green pencils, box number three, and so on and so forth. So the next time you are sent into this warehouse, get me all the red pencils. So what you do is, you see, oh, there's this guy around knowing something about the color. You ask that guy and say, hey, tell me where the red pencils are. And then this index guy will just point to the right box and say, it's in there. And so you can quickly seek this desired data and retrieve it quickly. And this is, as simple as it sounds, where it's boiling down in SQL Server. So the more boxes it had to open, the longer it will take. In SQL Server, we talk about logical reads when this happens. So in a SQL, of course, uh, in a SQL database, indexes look a little different. Yeah, we have this balanced trees, tree-like structures, just to recall that. We have two types of indexes. One index is the so-called clustered index, which defines the physical sort order of records, yeah, so how they are really stored uh, on disk. And all other indexes are so-called non-clustered indexes that are pointing to the data, that are pointing to the clustered index. And then these indexes can be used in two different ways. There's one way that's a quick way that's seeking through this balanced tree. Yeah, that's like walking through these branches. That's a quick operation, theoretically. I will show you later. If something stupid has to happen, like opening all the crates in this warehouse, um, this is sequentially reading the leaf node level of an index. That's what we call a scan. So now, if you remember this big O thingy, here a little simplified version. Scanning means the more boxes I have to open, the longer it will take. Yeah? So, so this is the red zone, let's say, in, in this O data thingy. Index seeking, the best case scenario is that I have to only read one page per index level. So in this case, that would be three reads when seeking through the index. Scanning, in this case, even means already four indexes. Of course, that's just a PowerPoint slide. In, in reality, that looks a little different. Yeah, so basically, scans bad, seeks good. Maybe, maybe not. So, we'll show you. So, just introducing my playground here. And please ignore the fact that this is an old Navision database. Whatever I say now, it only applies to NAV 2013 and higher. The old NAV versions, we have totally different horror stories. Yeah. The older, the shittier. Yeah, you know that. OK, anyway. So uh, just to uh, bring it back into your minds, um, GL entry table, we have this standard set of keys. Primary key slash clustered index is the entry number. So the records are physically sorted by entry number. Then there's a lot of other indexes slash keys. And just to put your attention on this one. Yeah? This is the one I'm going to use later on. So, here I have uh, just a little SQL magic um, to have a look into this GL entry table in the index structure from the Management Studio site. Um, so. so, the first thing is just counting the number of records. Yeah? It's, uh, this table already contains 3 million records. Then here I'm executing a procedure SP help index just to display all the available indexes in this table from Management Studio. Yeah, so you know I'm not cheating. Yeah, so it's still there, clustered index. And again, your attention please to this one, dollar one GL account number posting date. So this here is checking on the index structure, on the physical structure of the clustered index. This is upside down. Uh, compared to my PowerPoint slide. So here, the most detailed level of this index is uh, level zero. That's the, the first line here. And it has a width of 125,000 pages. So it means I need 125,000 boxes to store the 3 million pencils. This is the width of this clustered index. Nonetheless, it's still just three levels deep. Yeah, I have just one root node, and out of this root node, there's 200 branches growing out, addressing the next level, and so on. So SQL index we have are very, very wide, but never very, very deep. Yeah, they only have two or three levels and stuff like this. So 
This other index, the non-clustered index GL account number posting date, has a width of 10,000 pages and also just three levels deep. So that means our best case scenario is when we're using such an index is to read one page per index level. That would be one, two, three. Worst case scenario is to read everything. That's 125,000 reads. So, in the following, we also have to look into a thingy that's called data density. So data density means how many equal values do I have on a certain field. Um, here I'm checking on the density of the GL account number. Yeah, that's a field in GL entry. And on the account uh, 1575, that means I have 800,000 records of the same account. So again, my table has 3 million records and 800,000, so that's roughly a quarter of this, is um, based on this account number. And so I have different data densities. And here, for example, the last one, um, I only have four GL entries, which are uh, on this account number 3986. So that's my playground. So as, as Minka told, you can verify how your code executes by using profiler and stuff like this. So what I actually did is uh, had a little Navision code and running some of these commands, yeah, recording this. Um, to save time, I do not want to jump between nav and SQL back and forth and back and forth. So what I have here is um, just in plain code, the statements, the SQL code, how it would be executed via nav. Yeah, so this is how the, the shit would hit the fan. Yeah, just to have it a little more transparent. Okay. Um, find set. Yeah, find set. Again, this will uh, select all the data in the filter. Here I just have uh, you now plainly coded a filter, and I'm using uh, this account number here. This is the one with the smallest density, just four records on this account. I didn't care about um, sorting order, so I didn't specify a set current key. So a vision would fire automatically primary key sorting. So now I'm enabling some black magic on the SQL server. Um, this is so that I can also see the number of reads in Management Studio and stuff like this. I enable the execution plan so I can see what SQL server is doing behind the scenes. So now I execute this find set command. Of course, it's just four records. In messages, now we can see the logical reads, yeah? the, box, the number of boxes to be opened. 15 reads. Uh, one read is one page at eight kilobyte. So the very small memory pressure, everything okay. The execution plan shows here, when I go mouse over, it's using this index dollar one. Oh, hard to see, is it? you can see dollar one. Yeah? And dollar one, this is the index based on account number posting date. So why is SQL Server using that index? Because SQL Server always tries to find an index based on the where clause of a query. Now that's the content. If I ask you, get me the, the red pencils, you need an index knowing something about the color. It would be pointless to know something about the length or something. So this is what SQL Server is searching. It found this index because it already existed. Having the right indexes, challenge number one, in this case, I have the right index, which could be used. So SQL Server now could seek out the desired data. So what else does it have to do? Um, I didn't care about sort order. Yeah? So it was sorted by primary key. Well, this index here is sorted by account number posting date. So now what SQL Server has to do is it has to pump the data in RAM and TempDB, and so we have another sort operation here. So shows that theoretically um, I don't have to specify a set current key command. SQL Server is designed to deal with this kind of issues, to filter this way and to sort another way. And it doesn't do any harm. So that means basically a set current key is not mandatory for, for now. OK, um, we see the cost down here, yeah, the cost here. Um, that's a relative CPU time, so it has to total up to um, 100%, but we see that it is about half of the time spent just on a stupid sort. Yeah, so it doesn't come for free, um, this sort operation. Um, 
why 15 reads? Why 15 reads? Again, this table, the class that index is an entry number. So one, two, three, four, five. And four out of these three million records uh, met, uh, match to this account number. But these four records, they can be anywhere. They can be in this place, in this place, at the rear end of the table. So SQL Server has to walk through the index branches multiple times. Four records, three index levels, 12 reads, yeah? Four multiplied with three, 12 reads, plus some extra magic that's totaling up to 15 reads here in this case. So, but basically that was working okay. So now, um, comparing with a find minus command, find minus uh, at first will issue a select top 50. Again, uh, this top clause is automatically uh, generated and it will vary. I just use it as an example. So when doing this with a find, Z, uh, find minus, um, guess what? It is exactly the same kind of operation. Yeah, because I, with the four records, I'm way below this top clause. Nothing happens. So now, question about set current key or not set current key. Okay, just try it. So now, if I was setting a set current key command, my order by clause would be changed. So the order by clause would be something like this. Yeah, so in the vision, I would say set current key, GL account number posting, and yada, 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 and run the same code. So doing this again, hopefully again for records. The I.O. hasn't changed. It's the same kind of way to, to seek the data. The execution plan is pretty much the same. It's using the same index, but what is gone now is the sort operation. So what does that mean so far? You have to have the right indexes to support the where clauses, to support the filtering. This is the number one, having the right index. Set current key is not mandatory. But if you have a key you can use, then it's a good idea to use it because you make life easier for SQL Server. Yeah, but it's not necessary. So that means if you have a key, use it. But if you don't have a key, you don't have to necessarily create it. Bear in mind that Every index has some cost. Every index needs to be maintained, it needs to be written, it needs disk space, and so on. So theoretically, uh, reducing write performance. So we must not be too enthusiastic in adding indexes to the system. Yeah? So that means if you don't have a key, then you first have to see, uh, to monitor if there's a problem, if you need that key. In many cases, it might be not necessary. It works like a charm. Okay, so far that was all um, kind of best case scenarios. Now spoiling things a little bit. Um, or maybe before spoiling this, uh, because on this uh, thingy here, which you also can receive in this download package and stuff like this, I also have a code on these other commands, yeah, find first, find last, find minus and so on. Um, I hope you believe me, this actually is all pretty much the same. And all these methods need to have the indexes, yeah? So because there's some, some let's call it fake news, rumor, misunderstanding around, some methods uh, don't require an index or so, that an is empty will always work. That's total bullshit. Um, so like if I ask you a fine set, yeah, get me all the red pencils, you need an index. Get me the 50 red pencils, you need an index. Uh, find first, get me the first red pencil, get me the last one, check if there's a red pencil, count the re uh, red pencils. You always need to have an index. So all methods require uh, indexes. So that means that all methods here can work like a charm, but they also can all screw up. And I show you now um, how. So now, I'm switching to an account number with a very different density. This account number, uh, on this account number, I have 800,000 records in GL entry. So that is about 25%. So the query now is exactly the same as before. Uh, go for a find, uh, find set again. So exactly the same as before, same code executed. So the only difference is that the content of the filter has been changed. So now this will take a little while. Again, this is 800,000 records and a slow machine. Uh, anyone a joke? Newspaper to read on or so? Uh, 
So it takes about 20 seconds, yeah, feels like an hour, uh, so, but almost there. So, hey, I said 20, okay. So, check in on this, <coughs> messages. So logical reads, 125,000 logical reads. Does that ring a bell? Does that figure sound familiar? Um, this is exactly the total width of the clustered index. So that means now SQL Server had to open all the boxes. Check in on the execution plan, I can see, yes, it is doing a clustered index scan, yeah, going sequential. Because in this case, index seeking would be totally pointless. What would you do? 800,000 records, that means by statistic, every fourth record is one of those. It would be totally idiotic uh, to go uh, through the index view li like, like a squirrel after sniffing a line of coke, yeah, up and down, up and down. No way, this doesn't happen. So SQL also gives giving the finger and starts to read sequential. Okay, so, but now having a closer look. So now what we did, we added a set current key command because S, uh, set current key would make life easier for SQL Server. That's what we thought. But holy moly, yeah, shit happens. It's exactly this sort that makes it extra difficult for uh, SQL Server in this case. Because SQL Server has decided now to scan the, the, the clustered index, so going sequential, and the table is physically sorted by entry number. Now, my query was asking to sort the data by account number posting date. So, hell's bells, it has to pump all the 800,000 records into TempDB to resort. Hmm. Yeah, and this just because the data density has been changed. Uh, that just changing a single filter value here makes a total difference yeah, between uh, bliss and total doom, so to speak. Yeah. And the same would happen also with the other queries, yeah? Um, find, find minus, yeah? Find minus, some people would say, hooray, this is very quicker, way quicker. Use always find minus or something, yeah? Um, it was quicker, yeah? Hooray, 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 hooray. Uh, it was reading way less, hooray, hooray, hooray. It was uh, scanning, but not that much, okay? But anyway, but this is just half of the truth because that was just the first package, yeah? That was the first 50 because then I get a second round trip fetching all the remaining data which screws up like the uh, previous find set command. Yeah, so that's um, not, not really any, any benefit here. Yeah, so there's a lot of things that obviously matter in the execution of uh, statements on SQL Server. And there are also things that I even do not show. Yeah, that is, for example, the type of filter also matters. Yeah, if it's greater, less than equality filters, inequality filters. So, just to drive this a little on, what else could we do maybe to improve queries like this? The physical sorting order has also impact on this performance. Yeah, in this case, this fine set was reading all and everything. Uh, no, the fine set. I, uh, you remember, yeah? I don't execute again. So it was reading all and everything, yeah? opening 125,000 um, boxes. So what we could do is change the clustered index. Changing the clustered index means change the physical sort, uh, physical order of the records. I cannot do this on the original GL entry table because it will take forever. This is a super heavy transaction. Um, this is definitely something outside business hours. Yeah, so I have prepared uh, this already. So now this GL entry uh, 2 is a copy of the ori original one. Just here, I cluster the data on this account number posting date. So that means now that the records belonging to the same account number are close together. So now I'm firing this query on this GL entry table number two. Still, it is 800,000 records. Any newspaper? You had some time to fetch some? No? Anyone a joke? One line joke or something? Hell's uh, bells. I should have prepared one, yeah? Should I? Next time. Five seconds to go. So, almost there. Take care. <gasps> I said 20. Oh. Okay, so 
here we are again. So now, what has been changed? So the number of <laughs> records, hopefully not. Yeah. So what has been changed is now the I.O. a little bit. Yeah, so the net time was not that visible. But now we are down from 125,000 reads only to 30,000 reads. Why? Now, again, all the records belonging to the same account are closed together. So SQLSO doesn't have to read the full table. It only has to read a small portion of the table. 30,000 reads, that's roughly a quarter of the whole table a quarter of these 125,000, which is plausible because there is also a quarter of the whole records. So for this query, actually, this best case scenario. So this, of course, would also help the other accounts. Yeah, if I go back to, to this one here, that was the one with a very low density. Oh, sorry, that was the wrong button. So. Four records again, but now I'm down to even four reads. Yeah? Previously, it was 15 reads because it has to seek there and there and there in different positions. Now everything is closed together, so SQL just has to go into a position, maybe read the next few pages, and that's it. Yeah? So optimal performance here. And of course, the execution plan is very lean, um, just one operation here without any sort and so on. OK, so just to give you some examples how this kind of code executes in the SQL world. Just to recap, so there's a lot of things that matter. So first thing where you, your magic starts is to you have to avoid the round trips. But sooner or later, <laughs> some select statement will, will hit SQL Server. And the same statement could work like a charm, or it terribly screws up. So there are several things that you can influence. Yeah, you can influence how you filter, having the right index. That's the, the important thing here. Without an index, you're always screwed. You always have to scan. So you need to have the indexes. Sorting could help. Yeah? So, so how should you program? You have seen sorting helps. In other cases, it screws things up even more. You always have to target the, the supposedly best case scenario. So yes, you should use a set current key if you can. Um, because what I did was, of course, a very extreme example. In, in real life, that does not happen that easily. Yeah? It could happen, but must not. So you have to target the best case scenario. Because the, the big unknown thing here is the stupid data density, which, which could dramatically spoil things. And unfortunately, if you, <laughs> if you start a new navigation system on a Kronos database, you have no data density at all. Yeah? This 500 megabyte database, this is how performance testing is done in Copenhagen. Yeah? But you see, but, but then the, the system will grow and grow and grow and grow. So that means the data density in the system changes with every insert, update, delete we are doing. So that means that the SQL server behavior could change from one second to another. Yeah? It was seeking properly right now, and just next minute giving you the finger and starts to scan. This will happen. And, and unfortunately, this is a natural thing. And this is something you cannot predict from your pr programming perspective. So you have to do the best you can do in your seaside world. But you have to expect that sooner or later the shit will hit the fan. And again, this is natural. Uh, this will only not happen if you do not process any data. And maybe to keep this up in advance, this is not necessarily an F problem. Yeah, this is a, a, a thingy that you have also in AX and CRM in any SQL database. This is not even a SQL problem. This is something you also see in SAP and Oracle. This is just how these relational databases are working. Yeah? So, and so again, um, that some queries screw up is natural. And then we have to deal with this afterwards. Um, to find out if behavior changes, if anything stupid happens, there is a variety of tools. Uh, you, uh, Jasminka mentioned a lot of them. Um, I want to show you just a simple script, just a T-SQL script um, that is doing this. Whenever SQL Server is executing something, it's memorizing it. It has a thingy, a part of brain called procedure cache, where it just knows what query was executed, how often and how long took it, and, and so on. So in this script, it's just looking up these dynamic management views. 
And here you can all, uh, you can see everything that, that happens. Yeah, you see the, the query statement. You can see how often it's well executed. That also could help in identifying maybe code that has a maybe too high number of iterations somewhere. We can see the number of reads. Yeah, the number of reads, this is the most significant indication for performance issues. The more reads, the slower the performance. This is kind of rule. Yeah, so we can see the number of rows yeah, which are returned. It also maybe could help you giving guidance for your code. Maybe the result sets are too large. Maybe the filters are wrong or whatever. And of course, we can check on the execution plan. So we see really what SQL server was going. So that means with this script, um, you can quickly investigate if any expensive queries have hit SQL Server. So this script is grouping and counting. This version here is sorting it by total CPU time was spent, so to have the most CPU consuming queries on top, so that you can see, okay, what's doing real harm to the system? How often is it a single incident? Is it a recurring problem? Is it something you have to fix or maybe uh, can ignore or postpone? So when it's about fixing problems, um, if we are beyond this point of code iterations and stuff like this, um, these kind of expensive queries, the very vast majority of them could be fixed just by index optimization. And index optimization mostly means just to add the required indexes, one way or the other. Typical way how you are doing it so far is you do this in your Seaside environment as a table key. Every key will automatically be put as an SQL index. So, but this is something, and unfortunately <laughs> we don't have the time here in this session um, to discuss this really thoroughly. Um, you have a second option to do the indexing. You can do this on the database back end directly, because that is the place where you can do the real deal. Yeah, because Navision indexing sucks. NAV indexing, Tenerife indexing, whatever you call it. I, Navision indexing sucks. Yeah. So SQL side indexing rocks because here you have a lot of magic features to really create sufficient indexes that improve performance. But this SQL side indexing is something you have to learn. This is something um, you need to know the do's and don'ts, <laughs> like with um, so many things. Um, because if this uh, SQL site indexing is done in the wrong way, you can thoroughly and completely fuck up the database. Yeah, so this is also a promise. <laughs> um, no, so this is something you, you have to look into how this is done, um, which is no rocket science. Yeah, you can learn this. Um, in the easiest case, if there's a very, very obvious index problem, SQL Server can see that SQL Server uh, knows as part of the execution plan that there might be an index missing. And these missing index proposals can be collected. There's just another dynamic management view uh, where you can look up these uh, proposals. And then if you know how to do this or not, then you can directly create these indexes on the database. But the big disclaimer now. Um, these are machine-generated proposals. And these proposals often contain nonsense. Let's call it nonsense. I, I, I'm swearing too much. I almost dare to say bullshit, but I say nonsense. Yeah. Okay. Like this here. Yeah, this is not necessarily a good proposal because if you could follow so far, this is something we already have. We have an index slash key like this already. Yeah, it wants to include all the columns. Included column is one of these super cool features in SQL world we, we don't have in the Seaside world. But here, this is included columns used in a stupid way. So this doesn't make sense here. So in real life, this should never be created. But then again, you can tap on these missing index proposals. create this stuff. Uh, it takes a little while, 3 million records. Again, do's and don'ts, you have to know that. So, but then that means now the index is already there and SQL Server could immediately use it without you changing any metadata. 
Yeah, you don't have to change any table, not recompiling anything, not restarting any service here. You just add this, and SQL Server is immediately able to use that index. Um, so the question is how to document, how to manage, how uh, to roll out this. Here I want to provide you a, a second script, this uh, rescript index and stuff like this. This is a script which is listing this custom build stuff, um, also checking on the, the usage of this indexes, yeah, if they are really helping, if they are not helping, if they're not helping, well then drop index and so on. Here uh, actually the code to drop or to recreate is already prepared. Yeah, so this is some, some easy script to handle this index world outside the Navision application world, which could be a huge advantage. But uh, last time I say that you have to learn that. Yeah? Otherwise, you can do real damage to a database if you do it. So what I always say in the training is um, never ever copy, paste, execute this. Yeah? If it was that easy, Microsoft would do it. Um, and <laughs> But I recently learned Microsoft is doing it. <laughs> and, uh, no, not really. In, in Azure, you have some uh, feature like um, auto-indexing. Yeah? We were discussing this. We were not sure how, which algorithms are behind this. But obviously, there is a kind of auto-indexing feature in Azure. We have to check it out. Um, OK. Yeah, so index optimization. Um, I was focusing on this script for one special reason. Um, Microsoft is pushing us into the cloud with ultimate force, like it or not. Um, depending on the cloud scenario you are running, you are not able to run profiler or extended events or anything. Um, this kind of information, expensive queries and missing indexes, you get in any scenario, regardless if you are on premise or if you are knee deep into the cloud. Um, the SQL Azure telemetry stacks will deliver something like this. Yeah, so this is something, this, this expensive script, because it's SQL stuff that is already there. There are even standard SQL reports to, to uh, tell you about this stuff. And, and this is why I highly recommend to get familiar with these kind of, of, of scripts and, and SQL code, because this is something you supposedly will always have available to investigate expensive queries, yeah? if you cannot run profiler for whatever reason or so on. Yeah? Also with these missing indexes, that's super cool features. Um, and one way or the other, you can work with this. Well, So for your programming, again, you should code for your best case scenarios, as good as you can, as good as you can predict what will happen. This is a super challenge you have to face. Yeah? But you have to have in mind there are unpredictable things that will happen at one time. So that means you have to follow up on this. So just writing code and roll it out and execute doesn't do uh, the magic. So you have to test. Uh, as good as you can. If you can, you test always on real-life databases or copies of real-life databases because that's the only way to check on this data density. And again, you have to repeat this maybe. Yeah? So, so uh, it's not a one-shot firefighting this kind of index tuning because what's not a problem today, maybe it's tomorrow a problem. So you, you have to check on this periodically. So there will always be a demand for new indexes that also means that other indexes become obsolete and can be disposed one way or the other. Yeah, this is a, an, an eternal circle of life. But, but then again, this is natural. Yeah? So, so this is not a malfunction of SQL or NAV or something. This is just how these databases work. Well, so according to this, what also is uh, important, when it's about this density stuff here, yeah? how does SQL Server know how many different field values are there? And how so on. Uh, SQL Server maintains statistics. And to have these statistics accurate, you need to have some database settings enabled. That is, at least auto create statistics and auto updates that's enabled. Yeah, and years ago, there was different best practices, but nowadays, F that's online. Optionally, you can also add the asynchronous statistic update that uh, postpones the time a little bit when the statistic is updated. Um, for the older SQL server, so SQL server prior to version 2016, there's a little issue. Um, 
these auto-updater, the statistic manager, it depends on built-in change thresholds. And the built-in threshold in the older SQL versions is 20%. So that means that 20% of the data needs to be changed uh, until the statistic manager will update these statistics. That means if you have an item ledger entry table with 1 million records, it requires 200,000 records to be changed before the update uh, happens. This is not sufficient. Yeah, this actually will never happen. They have changed it in uh, SQL 2012. Yeah, they, they use dynamic uh, change thresholds, so some black magic automatically calculating on based on the table size. But you can enable this uh, also this with this trace flag uh, 2371 for the all. I think it's uh, even available back to SQL 2008 R2. And this could be beneficial for large databases where you have large tables and so on. Also, what just, uh, just have it on the slide to be complete. What, what matters in the query execution is the number of CPUs used. Um, so there's a setting in an SQL Server instance, the maximum degree of parallelism. And current best practice is set this to two, regardless of the number of CPU, one or two. That's the setting here. And what also could be important is TempDB optimization. TempDB normally is only used in combination with RAM for sort operations and, and work tables and stuff. Um, Navision doesn't create any objects in the TempDB so, and, and store any data. So. But these sort operations are also kind of unpredictable. Yeah? So we can have two records to be sorted, could be two billion records to be sorted. So TempDB, to optimize it, means we need to have one data file per CPU, no more than eight, yeah, then we have other issues. And on heavy, uh, high-load uh, scenarios with lots of transaction volume, it also might be beneficial to have TempDB on a separate physical disk or whatever um, to separate the physical I.O. But then again, this is a totally different story. So just have it on the slide for you to remember, maybe to follow up on this. In SQL Server 2016, when you install it, it will already propose the correct TempDB setup. Yeah? It will propose how many files you should create. Yeah, but also what is necessary in this context of query and index tuning um, is maintenance. These index structures, they fragment. Yeah? There are gaps in it and all kinds of shit. So uh, these indexes need to be fragmented. Uh, sorry, defragmented. Um, here I just have an example for maintenance plan. This is targeting uh, SQL Server 2016 and higher. Um, but with maintenance, to make a long story short, it doesn't matter how you do it. It's important that you do it. And you can do this with maintenance plan. You can do this with third-party tools. Yeah, there's a zillion of stuff around. I am providing tools. You all know the tools by Ole Hallengren. Um, so it doesn't matter. Yeah? There's just little differences in what these tools are doing. We can say that the old maintenance plans, yeah, prior SQL Server 16, they always take the longest time and have the heaviest impact into the system yeah, regarding transaction volume, uh, transaction log uh, load, and so on. Yeah, so maintenance means index defragmentation and statistic updates, also one way or the other. And this is the most important thing. This kind of query and index tuning is database maintenance. This is not just firefighting, yeah? Oh, getting rid of a certain problem. This is something that you have to do frequently. This, this is a task, a job that is done by thousands of DBAs every day. So this, but this also applies to our NAF world. Yeah, for the partner, this could be also a chance um, for making money. Yeah? You can sell this as a service to your customers if the customers don't want to do that. So when you go live with a system, a new system, this is something you should maybe check on a weekly basis. Later on, if everything is smoothly, then there won't be that many changes. Then everything is more or less stabilized. Then it's OK if you check on this every three months, every half a year or so. But you need to repeat this. Yeah? You have to expect something coming up. And again, this is normal. Yeah? So, so no hard feelings on this. Yeah, that's actually what I wanted to share. So, should we wrap it up, up a little bit? So, your conclusion, <laughs> final my words. <laughs> yeah, for, for my part, it's really simple. L like one of the first slides, minimize server round trips. That's the 
key takeaway really. So coding for performance is mainly about that. And then there is the application footprint kind of issues, which is typically reports and .NET. Um, but when writing code, minimize uh, database round trips. Um, find and find sets, use them as, as documented on net. Um, doesn't matter if they run with a millisecond difference, they all have constant execution order, so they're fine. Um, yeah, so plan your code well, plan with iterations in mind, so write scalable code. Yeah, and my final words then um, is check out how to tune indexes. In, with index tuning, index optimization, you can fix at least 80 to 90% of query problems that hits SQL Server. So this is the most important thing. You have to do it, you can do it, it's easy to learn. Yeah, there's another 20 people around who have just learned it the past few days. Um, this is most important because if you have learned this SQL magic adding to your seaside magic, then you can really, really tune uh, your code and then you have really program code that really rocks on the system. Yeah, so we have 55 seconds left for Q&A. And, a. So and please giveaways. <laughs> yeah, so only ask questions we can really answer, so. And only ask Jörg. What? <laughs> so, uh, we should use these <laughs> things here, or should we? Um, yeah. yeah. Ah. So, maybe you also. So I'm blinded, so I don't know who I hit, so. <laughs> is, it well, is it on? Yeah. yeah. How should I think about the database uh, compatibility level? Just use the highest, or is it... Uh, in, the in the supported Navision scenarios, you should always use the compatibility level matching to the server. Okay, so not to go higher than recommended. No, what is recommended? No, if you have a, an old okay. Navision, we shouldn't... Go no. too high, I guess. The, the compatibility level defines the, the language a database speaks, so the syntax interpretation. So, and of course, um, you should have always the server level, because then SQL Server internally could use all the features and benefits it has. Otherwise, it's, it's inter you only need this in a, in a lower level if you have your own SQL code that uses old syntax. But for NAV, this does not apply. Navision always requires uh, the server level. It's just because on the the, the, dem the Kronos demo database is uh, on 2008 um, configured, and everyone forgets to uh, increase it. But this is not the recommended level. It's just forgotten to upgrade. Oh, okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, the, so the second one. who first? Me first? Oh, sorry. You get this. <laughs> oh, thanks. No. I must have played with it a bit. <laughs> Maybe talk to the t-shirt that works. Okay, hello. <laughs> uh, there's one thing that has, uh, I have been bumping a lot when I'm uh, doing reporting. So uh, you were talking about um, data set optimizing. But um, in my opinion, and my experience also, have pointed out that uh, it's very us usable to, to create uh, temporary tables where you collect the data before you run the report. So that's something that I rarely have seen nobody, anybody tell how to optimize things. And I just uh, so so um, you do processing in tab tables and then just send outputs, yes. basically finished yes. output to, sounds like a good idea. Yeah, but that is optimizing data yeah, set yeah, in a way. Exactly. The, the, the resulting is optimized data set. Well, it's a good, a great suggestion. I don't know why nobody blog it. <laughs> I don't know why nobody uh, put, put example <laughs> like that. But okay. whatever will optimize your data set is, is the correct solution. So that sounds yeah, like Maybe to add to this, temp, uh, temp records are maintained directly in the RAM of the yes. service tier. Yes. So you save the round trips to the SQL server. Yes. And, and this is why you save these iterations and speeding things up. And yeah, yeah the, the, the reporting are usually, and this is correct, but the, the problem with the reporting is usually on sending data to the client side after they've been processed yes. on the report side. So the, 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 the amount of data is the problem yeah. rather than anything. But yeah, if you narrow it down to your timetable pre-processing to, to just what needs to be displayed, then yes, that, that helps. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. 
Mal. Oh. Okay. Um, if you see that the most common weight is async this? network I/O, is that a bad thing, and what's the most likely cause? Sorry. <laughs> if, if, the mo if the most common weight that we see is async network I/O, is that a bad thing, and what's the most likely cause? Uh, well, you will see it, and you will see much more of it than you used to in earlier versions for the simple reason that before we used to do the cursor uh, fetches, so you send for 50 records, they come back, server does this processing and repeats the process. Now, now uh, uh, there's this multiplexing where it fires off and it does for everything back in, in one go. So the SQL processes that very fast and places it is all, everything, the packets ready for server that still does its work. So you're going to see that much more than you used to see because we changed the whole technology and took away the expensive slow cursors. The only reason you saw less of them before is because basically uh, uh, NST was uh, um, processing and when it's done with processing, then it sends for right. So, so, so basically, that there were no, there was no room for async weights. That that, that was mm -hmm. a synchronous operation. Now it's not. Um, so you're gonna see them. But if you see a very many of them, then uh, there are normally a few things. Pages tend to generate a, a deal of them uh, because they read kind of up lists. Typically, they they'll read everything. Um, but but find set because. Find will try to, in optimistic hope, uh, uh, get some self-tuning number of records in optimistic hope that will cover your needs and you might never ask for the rest. Mm -hmm. While find set will just pack everything, leave it there for you. If you don't actually consume it, it will be hanging around uh, until the session is is um, uh, stopped or until buffers are full or um, whatever comes first. So. Uh, that I, you're going to see more of them. It, the, it's a natural um, before, uh, comparing to before 2013, so you will see more of them, but if you see too many, well, increase your memory and uh, watch out for the find setting code. Use find where possible. Okay, thank maybe, you. Maybe one last question. Uh, the t-shirt, did, did you get your t-shirt? Or who, who asked that? You did. Yeah. You have, okay. No, he has one. Oh, <laughs> oh he, he ah. has one. I'm not following. Hello, uh, one practical question. We have okay, twenty thousand uh, invoices. Uh, periodical posting during the night. One invoice posting two seconds. Everything is fine. Pretty complicated invoices. I mean, and uh, few times per quarter, let's say uh, something happens and uh, performance decrease. Let's say three or even four times. Nothing, uh, nothing happened on service service dedicated for uh, only for NAV. No maintenance, no jobs, no nothing. And uh, my question: How would be possible somehow to trace what is going on? What is makes this, uh, let's say, occasional decreasing uh, of performance, significant decreasing? Yeah, if I should take this up, um, as you said, this is a complex thingy because there yes. can be three things. Yes. It could be the platform screwing up, it could be the query performance, and it could be blocking maybe. But so um, I'm afraid this is something we should take up offline. This is something, it because that could be anything. Yeah. With this script, um, you can check yeah. on the query performance. If that is a problem, if it's an index problem, but that could, be, could have many, many reasons. Yeah. If it is the same process running on I same know. dedicated overnight so nobody's meddling. I know it's not easy. That's, 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 um, that's the point. Yeah, but there, there, there's always yeah. there's always explanation. <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, your question is how to find it. Well, I, one of the things could be the statistics updates. They would naturally update each time. But mm -hmm. do you in insert as many records each time? That's the question. So maybe the statistic mm -hmm. updates kick in at some time and mm -hmm. consume some of the time. Uh, maybe, as he said, uh, QA plans go for any reason. Some d data distribution is important. Uh, so, so if, if you suddenly, uh, if your invoice is a bit larger, so if you su suddenly um, inserting a, a, a volume of records that that are similar, to put it that way, that uh, that create a different data distribution, then somewhere along the line, the QA plans will 
kind of break or won't work uh, as well. So you can use the the nice QA plan script uh, Jörg was uh, talking about. Uh, which is available for download on my blog right now. To, to check if the QA plans changed, okay. you can check if statistics kicked in. Yeah, it's a complex, not a simple. Yeah. But okay, I would say no more questions. Question. Um, people are thirsty, me too. Um, yeah, we are around here the whole days. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to reply. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you.